Let me talk about something else, um, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, this is another exciting trade agreement that will bring, in our view, enormous benefits to American workers. The goal is to grow the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is actually in the process of being negotiated today with a number of countries in the Asian region, which includes Australia, New Zealand, Brunei, South Vietnam, uh, and Vietnam, we hope, um, Japan, and a number of the uh, countries on the, in Latin America as well. We hope that this agreement uh, will produce what we call an advanced 21st century high standards regional trade agreement that will create opportunities for a lot of American companies, not just big companies, but small and medium-sized companies as well. The key to this agreement, and the reason we call it a 21st century agreement, is that it is going to contain a number of things that we think are very important to American people. One is high labor standards. Another is high environmental standards. Another is that it will promote um, intellectual property protection. And another is that it will deal with a problem that I think is of increasing importance, and that is, if you look around the world today, it's not the same world that we've had in the 1950s and 60s and 70s and 80s. We're seeing more and more competition between private sector companies, private sector American companies and others, with companies that are strongly supported or in fact are owned by foreign governments. So that it creates an unlevel playing field or major trade distortion. And one of the things we would like to do in this agreement and other agreements is to create what we call uh, norms for and discipline for competitive neutrality, which is to say that if a government owns a company or provides support for a company, it has to have rules and obligations which do not give that company special benefits vis-a-vis -vis private sector companies. And we think this is going to be very important because it creates an enormous distortion as private sector American companies have to compete with state-owned companies or state-supported companies around the world. We're currently negotiating this agreement. Uh, we, our hope is that the TPP uh, will lead, first of all, to freer trade or expanded trade within a certain group of countries, the ones I mentioned, but that over the longer term, it can serve as the basis for a free trade area for the Asia Pacific region. Regional mobile-level institutions are Another, another pillar, if you will, of our economic relations with Asia, particularly what we call APEC, or Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. As many of you know, the United States is hosting APEC this year. Now, there'll be a lot of ministerial meetings uh, along the way, on trade, and environmental issues, and financial issues, and many other things. And this will all culminate with a summit meeting that will be held in President Obama's home state Hawaii in uh, November. APEC is a forum that enables 21 countries across the Pacific Rim working together to liberalize and facilitate trade, cooperate on regulatory issues, uh, support small and medium-sized enterprises, and improve trade transparency in the region. We view APEC as the preeminent regional economic organization and a leading driver of regional economic integration. At a speech yesterday to the senior officials of APEC, Secretary Clinton spoke out very clearly about our, our desire to make the most of this year as the host of APEC and to push the organization to do more to deliver, deliver useful, tangible results for its members. As the host of APEC this year, we will strengthen regional economic integration expand trade, and particularly focus on promoting green growth, which is something that we know is very important in this part of our country. And we've seen a number of examples today of companies in uh, the Detroit area that are focusing very heavily on green growth, on new technologies. I had a chance to uh, drive to Bolt today, the GM Bolt. But we also met with a lot of other companies that are related to the auto industry and some not related to the auto industry that are focusing on battery technology, that are focusing on other kinds of technologies, using uh, electricity more efficiently, um, and 
as a result of that, one of the impressive things about the Detroit area is if you haven't been here and haven't had a chance to see what's going on in Canton, Detroit, and other parts of this region, you wouldn't really understand just how dynamic this is and just how much technology is being nurtured and is growing in this region. Uh, people look at Detroit as the motor city, and I hope it's going to continue to be the motor city for a long time to come. But the motor city is modernizing itself just as the auto industry is modernizing itself. And this is going to be an area for new energy development, for clean energy development, for high tech development in the energy, and the battery, and the electricity fields, which could be similar in terms of its innovative capabilities to areas like Silicon Valley when it comes to semiconductors and software and other things. So one of the great things about the American economy is that different parts of the country have different strengths in different areas. And the Detroit area, I think, really has an opportunity to demonstrate enormous strengths um, in, in the area of energy technology of various types. So this is something that's very important to us. And we want to be able to enable companies here that are putting money and talent and expertise and innovation into these new products to be able to export them. And therefore, one of the things that we're focusing on is throughout the Asian region, where we think the markets are enormous and they're growing very rapidly. A lot of work needs to be done on APEC to make it a success, but we aim to use our leadership uh, to make it easier for businesses represented in this room to take advantages, take advantage of changes in the region and opportunities in the region. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned we're trying to do is work with small and medium-sized enterprises uh, in the Asian region. And one way we're doing that is because know that growth in markets is not sufficient uh, to enable companies to have access to those markets. In many countries, there are burdensome customs procedures, there are burdensome documentation requirements, and we're trying to address those and alleviate those. The APEC tariff and rules of origin website, uh, for instance, has compiled customs information and trade agreement information for APEC members in one easily accessible place so that if your company wants to export to any one of these APEC countries, you can go to this website and get a very clear idea of what their regulations are and what their customs requirements are, uh, which makes it easier in some cases to understand how better to sell to those markets. A business in Michigan can use these tools to evaluate export options and make important decisions, making it easier to take advantage of these opportunities. A final, a final pillar of our Asian engagement is building robust bilateral relationships. We work to, to develop trade agreements, we work for regional agreements, we work multilaterally, but we also have a number of very focused bilateral conversations going on. Many of you here tonight are particularly interested in China because it is the most rapidly growing and certainly the biggest market in the Asian region. Our economic policy with China is based on fully, me, fully integrating China into the global rules-based economic system um, and into a trading system in which uh, China respects the rules of the WTO and other international trading organizations. And also uh, respects foreign investment in China so that foreign investors who put their money into China uh, receive the same rights uh, in China as do Chinese so that there's no discrimination. And I saw on the table that there was an analysis of China's indigenous innovation policy, which has tended to discriminate against foreign companies operating in China. We've been working very closely with the Chinese to discourage discrimination against foreign companies, or put another way, to discourage procurement requirements that benefit Chinese innovation and discriminate against foreign innovation, whether it's by companies goods into China or companies that are producing in China as well. Uh, we encourage China to take on responsibilities for the global system that are commensurate with its financial strength and its commercial strength. We understand also that China, as a member of the WTO, needs to uh, comply with WTO rules and obligations, and we're pressing China to do this. China is a major power, and it must take on responsibilities commensurate 
with economic power and deals in the world we're coming. Not just because we have to do it, although we are certainly asking to do and there's a lot of pressure on China to do this, but because China itself has a great interest in the proper functioning of the global trading system. Uh, China is a big exporter and therefore how well the trading system works is of enormous importance to Chinese companies. China is developing intellectual property and therefore it wants its intellectual property to be protected around the world. If it does, it has to protect intellectual property in China. China is going to be investing more and more around the world. It wants its companies to have uh, the rights that other investors have in other countries and other economies. If it does, it has to give American and other investors in China similar rights and opportunities and avoid discrimination against them. So these are the kind of things that we're pressing China to do. And President Obama and President Xi Jinping have had long conversations about these kinds of issues. And I would like to say that we've made dramatic progress in convincing the Chinese to make changes. We haven't made dramatic progress, but we aim to. But we know that China is not going to change overnight, but we have seen some improvements, and we aim to see more improvements. And we think that the best way to do this is to convince China that it is in their interest to improve their practices and to see their long-term benefit, certainly the long-term benefit of their companies. And that's a key part of the dialogue that we have with China. The strategic and economic dialogue, which Secretary Clinton and Secretary Geithner chair every year, or co-chair every year, is really one of the most important vehicles uh, for doing this. We recognize, in particular, the benefits of the China market to companies and missions. Uh, an increasingly prosperous Chinese population has an opportunity for Michigan's agricultural exports to already export $1.6 billion worth of products globally. We see China being a growing market for agricultural products from, from this state. More and more affluent Chinese students seeking an American education will be good candidates for Michigan's excellent uh, institutions of higher learning. And uh, I know many of the universities here are recruiting students in China now. And many Chinese are quite anxious to go to the United States. Michigan offers excellent education for a number of these students. China is also pursuing an ambitious strategy of what they call going out, meaning that they continue to increase their outbound foreign direct investment. China's outbound foreign direct investment has surged in recent, recent years, reaching $59 billion in the year 2010, up from a yearly average of $2 billion in the, in the 1990s. So this is an enormous increase. And states like Michigan, who actively seek FDI, will benefit substantially from China's outbound investment policies. Chinese investment um, has already taken place in this state. Uh, Michigan-based next year employs 3,600 people um, and has received Chinese investment, which helps to create more jobs here and helps to sustain uh, growth. And we see that there are more and more opportunities. Uh, we are trying to do something that's particularly innovative, I think, and that is to reach agreements, and we've already uh, moved in this direction, to reach agreements with the Chinese whereby we will have contacts not just between people in Washington and people in Beijing, but between provincial leaders in China, provincial governors and provincial party secretaries, and the governors of the various states in the United States. Uh, your former governor, I know, has told me that she spent a lot of time going around the world seeking investment um, for the state of Michigan. And we now see that China wants to invest uh, this state offers important opportunities for Chinese investors. So getting uh, Chinese provincial leaders together with state officials in Michigan could offer opportunities for Chinese investment, either greenfield investments, particularly in high technology, or investments in existing companies. But we think this strategy is a very important uh, element of job growth and overall economic growth in the country. Today, the United States.